Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, welcome. Um, welcome to the International Journalism Festival 2023. Is there an echo going? No, that's just. Um, I am Samir Padania. I'm the moderator today um, for this session about uh, putting communities first in local news. Um, I don't, I often, you know, I've often been involved in sessions at the festival, but actually this is the first time I think I've been involved in a session about something I've actually done. Normally I'm doing things that are bringing other people together to talk about the things that they're involved in and trying to spotlight trends around the world. But actually it's really, it's a really exciting moment actually in, to, to be able to talk about something that I've been directly involved in. And all five of us in this project have been involved in uh, a project that we're going to talk about for the next 50 minutes or so. And it's really situated in um, what's a familiar thing for all of us. Everyone's heard it, you know, media's in crisis, journalism, public interest journalism particularly is in need of funding and crisis. And there's a, there's a sense of, you know, there's a need for new ideas and new models. And this was a chance to be involved in something in a different way. I do a lot of analysis of different kinds of trends around the world in all sorts of different countries from the very local level to the very global level. But through the people involved in this project, it was possible to participate in something that was taking a, trying to look at things in a very, very different and quite a fresh way. And I hope over the next 50 minutes or so, we'll, we'll get into the various ways in which that's true, and the conclusions that we can draw from this, and the approach that we've taken. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to introduce everybody right now. We're going to first hear from Jonathan Haywood, um, who's from the Public Interest News Foundation. And then after that, we'll come to a, an initial session I'll reintroduce at that point. But first, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Samir. Hi, everyone. Very nice to see you all. Um, so yeah, the Public Interest News Foundation, we're based in the UK and we focus on independent news media in the UK. And I know many of you are working in other countries, some of you in countries with real severe political challenges. And it might seem more obvious to worry about independent media in Ukraine or different parts of the world. But actually in the UK, as in other parts of Europe and the North, North America, we do have a real problem with the state of media and local media in particular. There's been a huge loss of local newspapers and local journalists over the last 20 years. And at the Public Interest News Foundation, we support those people who are trying to build new models of local independent journalism to make them sustainable so that they can not only survive but thrive. And ultimately, we want everyone in the UK, no matter who they are, where they are, to benefit from really fantastic journalism that speaks to them, for them, and with them. So that's why we care about this. But for this project, as Samir says, we took a slightly different approach. We didn't just sit around as a group of journalists and kind of worry about journalism, because we all love journalism and we know how fantastic journalism is and everybody loves journalism, don't they? We felt, no, let's break that cycle where we all collectively congratulate each other or collectively moan together. Let's go and just talk to normal people. Let's go out across the UK to six very different places um, in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the four nations of the United Kingdom, and talk to not just journalists, but local businesses, local financial institutions, local community groups, people from the culture sector, from the public sector, local politicians, and talk to them about their experience of local news media, because then maybe we can start to work out how do we solve this problem, not just by assuming what the answer is, but by actually meeting people's needs on the ground. So we began simply by asking communities what do they want from local news. We brought together very different kinds of stakeholders. Samir and I, in each location, facilitated a very open discussion about the past, present, and the potential future of local news and we supported people to begin to draft what we call a local news plan. So for each of the six locations there is a very embryonic, very early stage of a plan for what the future of local news might look like and what those communities might do themselves to support that 
future. So as Samir says, really pleased to have people here today who were part of that project to tell you a lot more about what happened. Thanks, Jonathan. And, and I think to follow on from what you're saying, I think there's, this, this sort of ripples upwards in a way, in theory, because I think often we see media in isolation from the communities that they're in. And really, the, you know, they're, they're sort of treated, how does the media cover your community? How, you know, it's that sort of dynamic that's set up. And in a sense, what we really wanted to find out was what role did this, does this wider group in a, in a community, from across a community, you know, these different kinds of stakeholders that Jonathan is talking about, how do they view that and how do they see the role of and the, and, and if you like, a whole community view on media and the role it plays in its local economy, its local democracy, its community, feel of community. And that's not something that we're seeing at a sort of policy level um, or at a funding level. So this, this was the sort of genesis of the project that where we came from. So first I'm going to turn to uh, Adam Newby from News Now. So you can give a bit more background on who you are on News Now and why, what was your role in this project and how were you how did you come to this? What was the analysis that led you to get involved in this project and work with us on it? Yeah, thanks, Samir. Um, I'm Adam Newby, acting CEO of News Now. We're a, a news aggregation platform. We're a bit different from uh, some of the other platforms because we, we're trying to support uh, sustainable public interest journalism. Um, obviously, as a platform, there are things that you can do on the platform to, to try and achieve that in terms of the, the design of the site and how you surface content. But we wanted to see if there was something more that we could do outside of our organization to, to improve the situation in local journalism. As, as Samir said, we were aware that um, the situation of local journalism in the UK was particularly bad. Large numbers of, of papers have closed and there's been a lot of consolidation. So a lot of local news now is coming from big organizations. So, um, we got to know the, the PINF previously, the Public Interest News Foundation, we got to know Jonathan. And um, so we started thinking about ideas that could help support local journalism, but not just be about parachuting money in, partly because um, often that's a very short term thing. I mean, it's, it's good to, to send money the way of local journalism, but sometimes it can just be a one off and then you get a grant and then that's it. We wanted to see if there's something more sustainable we could do, something practical as well, something that would give um, some sort of fairly immediate results, not something, for instance, that involves, you, you, we could have hatched a campaign to lobby government, for instance, but that's, you know, that's a hard slog, we wanted something direct and practical that we could do, and that would produce something sustainable in, in local communities. So this local news plan project was, seemed like the ideal thing to do. Can I ask, was there, I mean, you know, you're a company that's looking across a whole ecosystem. You're drawing in journalism into the platform, you're pointing to it, and you're seeing from lots and lots of different kinds of publishers stuff come to you. So did, was there something in the, in the data, in the, in the flows of information that were coming to you from local as opposed to national or international sources that you were seeing a, like a dip in local news, or a, like you talk about consolidation, but was there something there that you saw? You, that you as a sort of in a unique position, you know, as an aggregator sitting across the industry, you were sort of seeing something new or different? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly if we've seen a, a change there, but what we do see as an aggregator is that, um, I mean, I can talk later about things we're trying to do to, to mitigate this, but, um, a lot of lo good local journalism is about quality and not quantity. And if you run a platform, uh, you tend to find that larger organizations that produce a lot of content tend to crowd out the smaller ones. And, and they also have the resources to, to you know, that a lot of these large organizations um, that own local newspapers are, are very good at, at gaming the system and producing content that does well and get, gets clicks. And so they tend to dominate. Okay, but, they, but you're a for-profit business, right? Although you have this ecosystem view. So what was it that attracted you about to, to getting involved like in a project like this, which is ordinarily, well, you know, 
you know, my, my instinct as somebody who works in the sector would be to have gone to a foundation or to have gone to a trust or, you know, like a traditional philanthropic source or whatever. So it was, it was also interesting and instructive to me to be in, con you know, for us to be talking about it. So why, why is a business, did you decide to do this sort of thing? I think it's because we're, we're, we are uh, an independent business. We're still basically founder-owned, and and so unlike some for-profit businesses, we've got the freedom to do things that are not strictly about about the bottom line. I mean, really, nothing about this project is is it's not really a project that we're not we didn't fund this project out of self-interest particularly, um, and indeed, local news as, as a proportion of, of our traffic and the, and the revenue that we generate doesn't really um, doesn't really feature for us, but we but we thought we were particularly concerned about this. And I mean, I was talking about the fact that there's a particular crisis in local news, but there's also I think it's a place where there's a big opportunity because trying to make a difference at national level is is uh, the, the mechanism for doing that are, are hard. But at a local level, you can really intervene and try and change something fast. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, so the, the way that the project ran, as Jonathan described, we did in the four nations of the UK, we worked in six locations. We came to those through a sort of semi-data driven process. We looked at deprivation. We looked at a range of different factors. And we chose six communities, defined geographic communities within which to work. Some of them were larger, some of them were smaller, some of them were more or less rural and, and so on and had lots of you know, issues of diversity and things like that. So we, um, in the six places were in England, there was uh, Manchester, Bristol and a coastal town called Folkestone. In Northern Ireland it was a town called Newry, in Scotland it's Glasgow and in Wales it was a town in the north, uh, northwest of Wales called Bangor. Um, so we're very lucky to have two people with us, uh, one of whom um, was involved in actually setting up one of the meetings in Newry in Northern Ireland and the other who is a local media entrepreneur and uh, magazine founder and editor and owner um, who, was, who participated in the Glasgow meeting. So um, I'm going to come to Columba first. Columba O'Hare from Newry. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about uh, the picture where you're in Newry in Northern Ireland and uh, why, why you got involved in this project why you, when I approached you? I, OK. Absolutely. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, Colum Columba O'Hare. I founded a, a not-for-profit newspaper, an online newspaper, Neary.ie, as a platform to, to showcase the, the city of Neary, which is a city of 27,000 people, roughly close to the border in Ireland. And I recognised the importance of, of keeping people informed about local news and campaigns and try to make sure that those in authority locally have maybe our city's best interests at heart which in a lot of cases they don't always seem to have. At present, uh, we're involved in like local campaigns and things. We're supporting campaigns for a city park. We're supporting a campaign to ensure that Newry Canal, which is the oldest canal in Ireland, is kept navigable because there's a campaign to, to try and sort of close that down. Overall, there seems to be a, a lack of accountability from local council potentially blocking what, what the citizens of the community want. And I think Neary.ie and local media in general play a very essential role in trying to change that. Uh, when, when Samir approached me, why, why did I get involved? I'm not too sure now. <laughs> uh, I suppose the need for, for discussion around the importance of local news and how it's paid for has, has never been more present. And with the, the local funding environment getting more and more difficult to get a hold of. So, so when Public Interest News Foundation got in touch with me regarding their local news plan, I thought, here's maybe a perfect opportunity for, for me to hear opinions of other people, bring other opinions to the table. And I thought, well, I'm sort of very much out of my, my comfort zone, but the chance to hear a, a broad spectrum of ideas was very inviting. And 
from an eerie point of view, I, I can't deny also it, it, it was sort of good to feel that a, a tiny little city like Newry was important enough to be, to be considered as part of that initiative. So Newry people, just to give you an idea, can, can lack confidence in, in what actually is, is quite a wonderful place to live. And I, I would feel it's my job as part of the local media to address this and, and promote our area at every turn, which is, which is where the website comes in. Our city has, has two sort of established newspapers, as well as online offerings, and it sounds quite stable as, as a community, but just a few years ago the city had four weekly newspapers and online as well. And like while, while the advertising and sales income model worked for newspapers for years, no longer. Online, Nuri.ie depends very much on its healthy readership to encourage regular advertising income, but it's not enough. And I rely on a plan for funding for, for different projects, specifically uh, specific projects, donations and, and freelance work in photography and web design and all sorts of cocktail of things, uh, which while all taking up sort of endless hours, time could better be spent writing. So I suppose as, as literally a one-man band uh, in, in my organization, I have two needs to keep my local news platform going. One's time and the other's money, which is probably, uh, money's obviously the most important one. Local news providers like myself are we're passionate about what we do, and because of this, unfortunately, or fortunately at times, we can work many, many hours that the money isn't there to pay for. But that's that's obviously not it's far from sustainable or desirable in the long term. And in reality, to keep at what we're doing or even to grow more finance is needed to pay not just myself but ideal other ideally other people to work with from time to time. And that's really where the potentially sort of new thinking coming out of this project is needed to work out how that can be done for small enterprises like, like ourselves and for the, the general local media family. Thanks. Thanks. It, I, there are two things I wanted to pick up on in what you've said. So one, one is the thing about confidence. I want to say, when I, so I arrived, I went and did research trips to each of these locations. And when I arrived in Newry, Colin met me off the bus and we went to, he took me for a coffee and we went into the coffee shop and he was sort of explaining to the owner of the coffee shop, you know, he sort of said, well, you know, he's here to do this meeting, we're going to do some research about the local media and he's going to help us, you know, convene a meeting and the guy at the co in the coffee shop was like, why are you bothering to do that? Nuri's not, it's not worth it. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, it's ridiculous. You know, this just is worth any, anywhere else and I think that, that came across, there was a self-deprecation and a feeling of, you know, why, you know, no, we've historically been left out of these conversations and things like that. And I think it, it, it was emblematic to me of that, of that feeling that, that actually then when you started going around, you actually encountered a lot of energy and a lot of pride. But I think also, I think the other thing that you talk about, which is this, um, what I tend to think of, and I encounter this in, in journalism across the world. This is from everywhere from, you know, Latin America to Southeast Asia to Eastern Africa to where I've you know, been working over the last year to Newry is this sort of overwork, enormous amounts of effort and work that are put in by journalists passionate about serving their communities. And I think it was emblematic of you know, what you were doing in that process. And I think of it as a sort of information subsidy that we don't really quantify in many, many communities across the world that the amount, and I don't think communities are often aware even of that level of commitment and the level of overwork that journalists put in to serve their communities well beyond the resources that they have at their disposal. Anyway, thank, thank you, Colin Burt. And then I want to come to you, Rhiannon. Um, tell us how you, you participated in the Glasgow meeting, and you're somebody that we've known for a long time and have talked about these issues with. So can you, how as somebody who was sort of brought into the meeting, in Glasgow, how did it feel? What was the sort of, why did you want to participate in it? What did you get out of it? Sure, so I run a community magazine in the south side of Glasgow that I set up in 2020 to kind of meet a need that I saw that we had 
some Glasgow wide publications. We have um, ones run by Reach, and ones run by New Newscrest, so the big publishers in the country. But what I saw in my community in Govan Hill was that actually um, there was a lot of uh, negative reporting about Govan Hill that was mixed in with racism, with xenophobia, with political kind of things. And so for that reason, I launched a publication that wanted to give a voice back to the community so they could tell their own stories, they could feel empowered, they could feel connected, they could have access to journalism in the way that they hadn't, they'd previously been denied. So I was really interested in this plan and this idea, I guess, to, um, to look beyond my neighbourhood. So the work that I do is very focused on Govan Hill, which is a very small neighbourhood of 15,000 people within a much bigger city of Glasgow. But I really believe in the power and the impact that community media can have when you're working at really small, hyper-local level. And I was able to set up the support that I got through being a social enterprise, through being connected to things like PIMP, to things like ICNN, to other organisations that were able to kind of empower me to launch a publication. But I feel that that's, a, that's missing um, across the UK and across Glasgow, and I'm really interested in supporting more people to get involved with media, more communities to have their own publications. So for me, in one part, it was an opportunity to, um, to spread the word of what we do across Glasgow, but it was also the opportunity to connect with others who we hadn't previously connected with. So I'm very connected with community organisations within Govan Hill, but through the meeting, um, I was able to meet community activists, to meet organisations that work in neighbouring neighbourhoods that I hadn't previously spoken to. Um, and so those connections formed through that. Uh, I was also able to make connections with businesses that have then gone on to advertise in, in Greater Govan Hill. Um, and I was also able to connect with other media, so with local community radio that again is not within my neighbourhood particularly, but through coming together in this kind of space that, um, that PIMP kind of had opened up. Um, we have, we've now got joint projects that we're working on and we want to develop. So, as I was in the meeting, um, it was really interesting for me to sort of take a step back. I do a lot of talking about media and the power of media and journalism and the importance of journalism, but it was really interesting just to take a step back and sort of be quiet and listen to what other people had to say. And it was, I heard a lot of things I didn't know but about how much people did value journalism and local journalism and people that I weren't expecting them to kind of say that. So for me, it was just an opportunity to, to connect with others, but also to have a chance to, to build journalism in Glasgow and to think about how it could be developed in the future. Thanks, Ryan. Um, do you want to just wave your magazine, actually? Because I, I want you to see, you know, the, the thing that actually, it's a, like a really beautiful magazine. It's a beautifully put together piece of media, but anyway. Um, com coming back to you, Colin, but like, you know, as Rhiannon's talked a little bit about what it felt like in the meeting, and her, you know, can you, because you, you brought together the meeting in Newry, can you talk, us, talk to us a little bit about that meeting? What it felt like, what you took from it? Yeah. Uh, I, I suppose at the start, been been given the, the task of organising the, the meeting for, by yourselves and, and trying to get a, a wide selection of the Newry community together was quite a challenge. And from my perception, I, I thought it would be quite difficult to, to get buy-in from, from people to dedicate three or four hours of their valuable time to discuss what, what might have seemed like an alien concept to them, the importance of and, and the challenges with providing local news. So thankfully though that, that wasn't the case and at, at the meeting in, in Uri we had, we had nearly 40 people from vastly different walks of life earnestly and with a genuine interest discussing the importance of them being kept up to date with local happenings from outlets they know are trustworthy and have, have the best interest of, of the city at heart. At, at that particular event, we had we had local businesses, we had campaigners, we had banks, we had social enterprises, we had arts organisations, we had churches, community groups, chamber of commerce, funders, unions, government bodies, politicians, and members of the media along with them. And and what was most noticeable at at that meeting was a completely sort of 
different dynamic in, in that room with all those different people from different walks of life. Such a varied audience and how everyone was, was looking at the issues from, from their own perspective. But like all were, at the end of the day, all were, were aware of how local news providers could benefit them or their organizations, although I think most of them probably up to that point hadn't grasped the challenges that were faced in actually getting that news in front of them. So just to give you an idea of the challenges, just over a month after that meeting, local newspaper, The Newry Reporter, which had been published for 155 years, announced they were closing. And they were only sort of rescued by a, a last ditch sale to, to National World. And, and so that, that brought sort of the challenges that local media are been faced right into the spotlight. But my sort of take from, from that meeting and all was just, as I say, getting all those people in, in, in front of me, uh, in some ways it actually made uh, my media outlet seem a little bit more important than I maybe perceived it to be. So from that point of view, it, it, it certainly benefited me. So that's, that's where I'll stop at. Yeah, I mean, I... Between, as Jonathan was saying, he and I facilitated this whole series of meetings. And I facilitated that meeting, but really it was sort of extraordinary. I just sort of lit the touch paper. You know, there was a sort of scaffolding that we provided and sort of, and there were eight tables of people over the course of three hours, we thought, that would be discussing this stuff. But this actually continued. They, they sort of said, actually, can we just work while we have lunch? We're not going to break. We're going to keep going. They wanted to keep going. They went going for like four and a half hours. I was like, it's an extra it was an extraordinary amount of energy that was in the room related to this. And you had people like the local, the, you know, the of council. And yeah, the, yeah. Chair of the council yeah. came. He put on. He said, "Would you like me to wear my official chain of office while I address the meeting?" And you know, things like that. It was a really, it was, there was a genuine sense of kind of this is an important moment that you know he gave a speech. He'd been a journalist. You had the former finance minister of Northern Ireland there. You had local MP, you know. So, the, and and they were sort of wanting to take charge of the process. They said things like, you know, we want. They, they came out and there's music to my ears. They said, we want a 12-month strategic plan, and we want to see where we are in a year's time. All right, fantastic. Go ahead. But I think you know the, all, what was interesting to me was what happened afterwards. So you were sort of, you're saying about this newspaper that was very much the centerpiece in a way, or the most prominent paper locally, you know in the meeting and a month later it was sort of in crisis and closing down but then there was also a response after that if I remember there was um, the local business community and various things like that came forward. Do you want to? Yeah, I suppose again uh, until the 11th hour I suppose nobody sort of pricks up their ears and uh, listens to it. so I suppose when when Yuri reporter and all was continuing along nicely nobody thought of any threats then all of a sudden this uh, organization that was taken f for granted by the locals as always been there and always going to be there was uh, going to disappear in less than a month's time so that that got a serious amount of done the debate from from the business community, from the just ordinary people in the street, and it was the the topic, the full topic of conversation, for basically a week or so. Like you know, so it, it again it shows the importance of uh, or how people see the media and the local media and claim ownership of it and feel very connected to it. I mean, Rhiannon, were there any sort of ripple effects that happened, you know, around or from the meeting that you can, you know, that you've been involved in or you've observed? Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, ripple effects and kind of benefits that we saw um, at Greater Govan Hill, um, there was a community activist there who had uh, led this change in his neighbourhood, which was neighbouring to Govan Hill, but who I hadn't come across before. So when we had a a meeting in our community newsroom in Govan Hill, um, I was able to invite him to give a talk and it was sort of creating connections between communities that we hadn't necessarily, we wouldn't have known about otherwise. Um, we have since set up a community newsroom, so um, we had the, the event, I think the, the local newspaper event was in October and 
Um, a couple of months later, we came together with the Ferret, who is investigative journalism co-op, um, to launch a community um, newsroom within our neighbourhood. And that was something that came, I mean, the idea didn't come from the meeting, but certainly within the meeting that we had, there was talk about the need for having some kind of local news hub. Uh, and it was um, validating to know that there was kind of an, an interest in that. And so we have since now um, opened this newsroom. It's a collaborative space. It's not just us in there. We have other journalists from other publications. We have freelancers. We have researchers. Um, and we use that space uh, not just for our journalism work, but also to host kind of community events where we are, in a way, we're doing, we're doing a similar thing. We're bringing together businesses and community organisations and activists and residents uh, and creating that same sort of space where conversations can happen. Thank you. Um, what about for News Now, for you, How, as, as a sort of, you know, kind of hands-off funder, but also, as you know, you're, you're also involved in the news industry and you're, as you were talking about the sort of things that you're observing that you care about, the health of public interest journalism, and actually you, be, you describe yourselves as a sort of public interest journalism news organisation. As you've observed this and you've sort of seen what, what has come out of the meetings, what have you taken from that? Yeah, I mean, I think... When we were talking about the, the project in, in, in the beginning, I think we had some maybe a sort of slightly utopian view of what we might achieve with this. I think had some sort of idea that maybe in some areas we would act, actually be putting funders in touch with journalists and concrete things will come out. And obviously some really nice concrete things have come out of it when you listen to Rhiannon, it's catalyzed a, a lot of uh, good stuff. But obviously these are kind of pilot projects and it's the start of a process, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and um but i think the local news plans are a really good it's a really good process and a good template to to try and get people together and and give a boost to local news i think one big thing that came out of it for us was just observing um the diversity of of needs and the diversity of approaches that you need in, in different areas in local news um, yeah, I mean, even to, to the extent of, um, I think in conversation with Jonathan, I'm not sure if this is in the report, but the idea that the UK is now, is, is a multilingual country, for instance. I think the, the workshop in Bangor was run in, in Welsh with translation. And uh, so, yeah, that's just one example of how you've got lots of different needs. I mean, Different areas are, are at kind of different levels of uh, in this as well. And I think the project was carefully designed to kind of experiment in different areas that have different levels of provision of news. Like in Bristol, you've got quite a good, you've got a, a set of very good local outlets that are also experiencing a lot of problems, financial problems and, and this kind of thing. But that in other areas, you don't have the same thing. So it's a, it's a very, very diverse picture. Yeah, Jonathan, maybe do you want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the different, you know, we've heard a lot about Glasgow, heard a bit about Newry, you know, about some of the other places and the, the distinctive elements in those, and then we can come on to, you know, maybe we can talk about some of the big conclusions we drew, and then we'd like to bring, obviously, you all in with the questions that you have, uh, observations, and so on. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the, it was an amazing privilege for us to go around the UK, go to places in some most of them I hadn't been to before, go into a room with people who'd given up their time, as Columbus says, and much to our surprise, were really enthusiastic in talking about local news. Most people in these workshops had not ever had that conversation before, but the minute they began to have the conversation, they, they sort of realised local news is really important to them. Most people of like my age or above grew up with local newspapers and it was a big part of their childhood. So they saw themselves in the paper winning sports competitions or when their school prize day happened or, you know, it was a big part of growing up and recognising yourself as a member of the community. For younger people, they hadn't had that experience, but they could see how that could be really important. So everywhere was different and everywhere was the same. You know, in every place, people were very unhappy with the state of local news provision. And what really pisses people off, to be frank, 
is pseudo local news. So when they have a supposedly local newspaper, which is actually full of content that is national, or it's content about celebrities, or it's content about sports, or, or national politics, or just very, very low rent content which is being churned out across the country and dropped in, and maybe sometimes with a tiny, what someone called a veneer in Manchester, they talked about a veneer, like a varnish of local news on top of what's essentially generic national or international content, or at worst, clickbait. So what people uniformly want is genuinely local news. But then obviously that means very different things in different places. So in Bangor, as Samir says, in North Wales, there's a Welsh-speaking community in that part of Wales, and there's a strong tradition of Welsh-language community newsletters where local people come together and, and literally produce a newsletter together. Someone prints it, someone folds the paper, someone takes it around the neighbourhood and delivers it door to door. That's a tradition which you can build on, but that tradition doesn't exist in other parts of the UK. In other parts of the UK, there are very different traditions. In Folkestone, where we went on the south coast of England, a fairly forgotten, deprived part of the country, um, very concerned about immigration. It's where lots of small boats land when they cross the channel. So there's a big division in the community about whether you welcome or resist immigration. But there is lots of investment in local culture. So it felt like that's possibly one way into thinking about local news as you work with local cultural institutions. So in each place, different possibilities, different challenges, but everywhere wanting it to be genuinely local, reflective of the diversity of local communities, but also creating a space in which all of those communities could come together and recognise each other as one. So again, another very particular idea we heard in one place was that they really liked hyperlocal media, really, really niche media for really small subsets of the community, but they wanted that then to be aggregated. So maybe there's a print weekly or a website which would bring together lots of different hyperlocal media outlets in one place. So like a really interesting creative idea that I hadn't had, hadn't, hadn't heard that idea before. It just came organically out of a morning spent together drinking tea and having sandwiches and talking for the first time. So people want local news to be truly local, but that means completely different things in each place. And actually, when you start talking to them, they do have good ideas about maybe how that could be funded. So the local councils, local public sector institutions, local advertisers, when they just begin to see the value it could bring to their community, they begin to think about the ways maybe they could provide either financial or other kinds of support to make that possible. I mean, the you made me think about there was one um, in Newry meeting actually the local there was an association of like social enterprises, and the guy from there said at the end of the meeting you know we were talking we the, the structure of the meeting was like let's talk about the past what do you remember about local news let's talk about the present let's talk about the future that you want to see and then what can you do to bring that about it's a classic sort of community empowerment meeting in a way but focused around news, and in that last bit this guy from the this local social enterprise community said all the different social enterprises, they spend an inordinate amount of their money on digital advertising. They give it to Google and Facebook. But actually, the people that they're trying to connect with are all in this area, really. I mean, some of them are selling services beyond, but actually a lot of them are in this area. And we, we sort of drifted away from that idea. So maybe we should ring fence a percentage of our advertising that we commit that every year we're all going to spend money in this area on local businesses like Columbus or others. And I think that was quite an interesting revelation in the meeting that you know they, through collective discussion themselves, determined that that was an outcome they wanted. One of the other things I thought was interesting, again, this kind of what is public interest journalism, and I, you know, I, it's not the boring end, but it's like the predictable end of this, oh, public interest journalism is this kind of thing and it's very serious and whatever. So I. I asked somebody, what, what in Manchester, what, what do you, how do you define public interest journalism? And he sort of looked at me and he went, restaurant reviews. Well, I was like, explain, you know, it's like, fine, explain. And he said, well, if you're a new business, you're a young entrepreneur, and you want to get people to come to your new cafe or restaurant or whatever, how do you reach people? How do you know, how does somebody who's trusted in the local community refer other people to you? 
and how that used to happen was through restaurant reviews, but actually the local newspapers and the local media, independent media, don't have resources. The same as, you know, so they don't get covered, they don't get the footfall, people don't cross the city to go to that exciting new thing as much as they would do. They rely much more on social and word of mouth and accident. And, and so the same is true of cultural events, same is true of businesses and services and things that are in this community. And I think that was what was an interesting thing that came out, that everyone had this incredibly sophisticated idea of the relationship between the presence of local media, diverse local media, that were accessible to the whole community in some sort of way, and the health of their democracy, as, as Columbo was talking about, but also of their activism, as Rhiannon was talking about, but also of the economy, and of the community itself and its sense of itself. So I think that was, you know, a lot of, the, you know, we, we sometimes talk a little bit abstractly, but for them it's an incredibly concrete thing. The presence of these media affects whether they survive as businesses or not. And that was fascinating, you know. I was just going to say, I mean, that's why we really, so the reports, and there are copies of this on the table outside, there aren't that many copies, because I had to carry them all here, uh, and the aeroplane uh, doesn't allow that much weight. Um, but so, so we call this media wealth building, so there's a term that we use a lot in the UK in the social sector of community wealth building, the idea that if there's money in a community, it's much better to spend that money within the community because it feeds into a circular economy where people have then got more wealth within the community and it just becomes a positive cycle. So we tried to apply that concept to thinking about local media and to call that media wealth building. Whereas Samir says, if you have local advertisers, local businesses, local public sector organizations in a community and they're spending their money buying services or buying advertising from outside the community, well, what the hell are they doing? Why is that money? Why is that local money being allowed to pour away to national or international organizations when it could be held and, and, and become something, something more virtuous? And the same with information. Why, why do we exploit information providers like Columba and Rhiannon? Why don't we genuinely value and support them so that they can do what they do even more and, and even more sustainably? So that's the concept of the report. Okay, thanks. No. We've got, we've got a few minutes left, and I think before we, we'll, we will come back and do a little wrap up and you know, explain where we think we'd like to go next, individually and collectively, and all of that sort of stuff. But could we, are there questions from among you? Okay, I'll take three as we go. Okay, there are two right here. Should we start there? And please, um, if you feel comfortable doing so, say who you are and where you're from. Uh, sure, my name's Francis Kennedy. Um, uh, from Rome. Um, I was a journalist, I'm not more. Um, I, uh, I'm curious that there's been n almost no mention of radio in all of this. And I mean, historically, traditionally, um, also, if you look at developing countries, the whole sense of it is one of the basic ways in which communities are connected. Thoughts, comments? Hello, I'm Sofia Verza from the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom. Um, just wanted to ask if uh, throughout this research and these meetings, uh, you found out that so-called underserved communities, let's say uh, in terms of information, tried uh, to organize themselves bottom up uh, with some citizen journalism initiatives or uh, Small, small community media initiatives. Huh? Okay, were well, there any other questions that we can button? Please, go ahead. Oh, yeah. just over this side, thanks. Hi, my name is Molly Enking. I work for PBS in the United States uh, for a new project called Preserving Democracy there. Um, we heard a lot about how engaged people were in these panels, how excited people were, how there was more uh, interest than anticipated. What did people say about their willingness to, or likelihood to actually engage on a day-to-day -day basis with local news and even pay for it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Do you want to? You're looking at me. Well, no, I mean, you know. Yeah, I'll give it a go. I mean, it's so the last one, I think. Okay. Well, I'm happy to have a quick go at all three. Or I think I was going to come back to you on the underserved and the and the radio. I'll take the last one. Yeah. Okay. Willingness to pay. Yeah. So at the end of every session, we invited people to step forward to the front of the room and to make a commitment. You know, what could they, as an individual, do? But in some cases, they were also individuals that were representing the local council or a local foundation or a local business. Um, but those that were just individuals with no particular institution behind them usually would say, yeah, okay, I get it now. I realize the value that I'm being provided with. I will make a small monthly donation. I will take out a subscription. Or even simply, I will engage. Yeah, I will, I will be, I'm now aware of my local community media. I will, I will take it seriously. So it definitely moved people along on that journey. I mean, it's a hell of an investment in time to run six workshops across the UK for 20 or 30 people in each place to take, to, to take them on that journey. But it, but it made us realize that if you do, the, the enthusiasm is there, but it has to be unlocked. Yeah, and, they, and I mean, part, we, we sort of, what we did was we, between us, we kept swapping roles in the different meetings, we did different things and used our expertise based on what was happening in the, in the live room, if you like. But quite often what they'd ask is, well, what other things are available in other communities that have been done? You know, how have people done things? And, you know, I, with my experience of how public interest journalism gets funded around the world, could bring in examples that would resonate with what they would think. So sometimes it was, as Jonathan says, that it would be creating a local news fund. You know, in the US there's a, you know, the community news fund thing going on. And there's a very, you know, it's very, I mean, lots of examples in the US that we're all incredibly jealous of. Um, so please do feel free to dispense your largesse across the globe. Um, but, uh, you know, in lots of other places drew inspiration from examples from Czech Republic or Indonesia or here, there, you know, there are, people are trying to grapple with these issues in lots of parts of the world. It's not unique to Britain, obviously, and it's not unique to um, this group of people. It's like many of you are dealing with these things and trying to think about how to motivate or structure ideas. But, you know, in each of the places, people did want to concretely engage with that. One of the things, you know, about paying for media that came up in Newry was that many people, they'd sort of, they'd, when saying to the, they, they talked to the editor of the newspaper that then subsequently nearly closed down, and they'd say, well, um, I just want to say that actually I, I used to buy the paper, but I haven't bought it for about 20 years. And after about the fifth person, I was like, what did the newspaper do 20 years ago that stopped everyone buying it? And I think the answer was go online, you know, I mean, in a way, and people sort of, you know, and it just kind of became part of the stream of things, you know. But, you know, anyway, go, go ahead. Uh, can I just... just just to give an, uh, from a, a tangible point of view of the, the Nuri meeting and how it sort of specifically helped Nuri.ie, you could say. Like, uh, the local Chamber of Commerce arranged a Meet the Media event, and as a result of that, different advertisement sort of options were sort of uh, brought up and uh, engaged with. Uh, I also sort of ended up getting access to different jobs from some of the people there and photography and all sorts of things. Uh, it gave me a chance to, to publicize to a very much wider audience. So all, all these things were, were quite tangible on a small level for me in particular. So uh, that's, that's what I can say. Like. Thanks. And Rihanna, do you, you talked a little bit about the radio thing. And again, you've, you know, you, you're from a very, very diverse work in a really diverse community with a range of different kind of you know needs do you want to just talk a little bit about mm. so greater given how the community that my magazine serves is one of the most um culturally and ethnically diverse neighborhoods in scotland um it has traditionally um been very socially disadvantaged as well um so and the media that was there in that glasgow meeting was myself uh, and there were some others and there was two other radio stations that were there actually community radio stations one that is serves the kind of south asian community in glasgow and one that serves another um typically disadvantaged neighborhood um and one of the things for us that came out of that meeting was that we they kind of highlighted a need for local news bulletins which they were currently getting their news from kind of national kind of radio news suppliers um, and through having that meeting and that chance to talk um, 
we have now developed a plan where we, in our magazine and our newsroom, we're, we're getting a little radio podcasting studio fitted in, and we're going to start creating local news bulletins, which they had a real appetite for and they're really excited about doing. And we're actually working with a group of people who have experience with the asylum system, so refugees and people currently going through the asylum system, to train them up on radio skills, which will, they'll then um, be producing news bulletins to go to the community radio stations. So it was a really nice kind of tangible project that came out of that meeting as well. Yeah, and I think I mean, my background is also partly in radio, and I, and I think in different settings, you'd see the mix of radio being, you know, greater or lesser, and the you know, mix and, and, and diversity of media that would be involved would be very different. And of course, in many places, radio is incredibly important, particularly one of the other places that came up. We didn't do the work in that area because it didn't come down, it didn't get to the final list of six but was in a part of the UK where radio is incredibly important because you're very dispersed and quite sparse population. So, you know, the, it is definitely on the radar as, a, as an area. And I think the underserved populations question, you know, bottom up, a number of the organisations that were involved across the set of six were ones that were either founded by or intending to support communities that are of that kind. But I think it's, you know, in a way, I think from what you're, you know, building what you're saying, there was a real diversity. And I think it also revealed to us a little bit of the diversity of local media ecosystems and how they exist and how, how nuanced they are. You know, I don't know if you, you had observations about that. We've got five minutes. Have we got four minutes? Oh, we finished. <laughs> we actually ended broadcasting. Oh, my gosh. Should we, should we do one? Can we close? Okay, so hopefully, thank you for your questions and thank you for, for listening. I mean, what, what we are obviously hoping to do with this project, and you can have a look at this and talk to us about it outside, um, is to deepen the work where, we were, where we've worked already and expand to other places and also exchange with others around the world who are doing this kind of work. So if you do know of or involved in projects, whether you're trying to do similar things, please do approach us and talk to us about it. Anyway, thank you very, very much for your time.